Open your Bibles to the 11th Psalm this morning, please. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he will rain snares, fire and brimstone, and horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteousness, Lord loveth the righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Father, thank you for the assurance and promises from your word that strengthen us in a difficult day in which we live. We ask only now, Lord, that you would help me to be able to convey that which you've laid upon my heart that it should open hearts and ears to your message this morning, that you might be glorified. And we'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Eleven and verse four says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven, and his eyes behold and his eyelids try the children of men. Realize what that verse says. The Lord's watching us right now. The Lord is watching you and I. Not only that, but he says that he tries, try the children of men. What does that try mean? It means to look at your heart to examine you as far as your spiritual condition, as far as your physical condition, as far as your needs, knows your griefs, knows your sorrow, knows your joys. It's uh, the, eyelid, the eyes of the Lord is up on us. I picked up a paper one day last week, and one of the articles in it said that Man has made a uh, radar about the size of a cell phone and said you can walk up next to a building and hold that cell phone against the outer wall of that building and it will tell you whether there's somebody alive inside. They can either engage the breathing between a man or an animal. And you know, we marvel at the inventions of man. I've heard several folks discussing that particular article as to how much we can, uh, how much man can, is able to discern. But I just read to you something here. I just read to you the fact that our God can discern. And he discerns not when he holds a, thought, a cell phone up to a wall nor if he had held it over the balcony of heaven. He reads it from our very hearts. He's looking right now into your heart and into mine, and he says, I'm weighing what I find. He not only says that he's doing it for us, but he says, and the Lord trieth the righteous. In other words, he says, but the Lord, the wicked himself, and the love of violence, his soul hateth. So God says, what I find, I respond to. That's the thing when it means to try. God just doesn't look at our hearts and pass by. 
God looks at our heart, and then He begins to work through however God chooses to work to begin to affect what He finds in your heart and in mine. We cannot comprehend this kind. I'm not out, okay? <laughs> All right, boy. okay, leave it on. Might work again someday. I can get a hold of a mic, and it, it destroys it the minute I pick it up. But anyway, the thing that I'm trying to bring about is the fact that, that God knows everything there is to know about us. Yet it seems that in our lives, so often we're not even conscious of the fact that God is observing us, not just here in his house, but when we leave his house, God is still going to be observing us. When we go to our homes, God says, I'm still being observing, I'm still trying. In other words, he's weighing everything there is to weigh about you and me. He's, he's constant and considered. It says, verse 4, he said, the Lord is in his holy temple. His Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold and his eyelids try the children of men. And yet, we don't seem to remember that. We don't seem to really think about it consciously that wherever we are, whatever we do, wherever we go, God is accompanying us in the person of the Holy Spirit which indwells us and God is interested in exactly how we will pursue a thing. Because he said in Psalm 34, 14, basically he said this. He said, depart from evil, do good, seek peace and pursue it. You know, that's good advice from God, isn't it? Look what he says. He said, depart from evil, do good, seek peace and pursue it. That's good advice. Because here, he said, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his, uh, his ears are open unto their cry. So what I'm trying to bring about is sometimes we live so lightly in our lives sometimes that we do not become conscious of the scrutiny of the Lord. That God sees us as we live our daily life. Not a day have we opened our eyes in the morning that God has not been fully aware when we opened our eyes in the morning. And it looks into our heart. Today there's a mindset among the saved and really among the unsaved that God doesn't know about their life. Or if he does know, he's not interested enough to observe what goes on. But that's not what God says. He said in Psalm 10, 11, he said, He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten he hideth his face. He will never see it. That's not only the philosophy of the unsaved today, but it's almost almost the philosophy of some that know Christ. Not to be conscious, not to be willingly conscious of the fact that God observes us. But he responds to the place, and he said that he does respond. Now, Psalm 94, verses 9 and 11, he says this, He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, Shall he not see? He that chasteneth the heathen, shall he not correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of men, and they are vain. They're vanity. They're useless sometimes as far as the thoughts of men, but that doesn't mean that God isn't fully aware of them, because he definitely says he is. He says in Proverbs 5, 21, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth, he pondereth all, that little three-letter word, all he doeth. Do you realize God's pondering right now what you're doing? He's pondering what, what you are thinking. He's going to ponder what you have existed in this morning. When you leave the church this morning, he'll ponder, well, one thing, he'll ponder whether you got anything out of it or not. He'll, he'll, his, we cannot seem to grasp the truth of this, and yet we're told constantly 
throughout the scriptures about this ob uh, uh, as observations of God. The psalmist David said this, very descriptive. It's one of my favorite passages, but he says this, O Lord, thou hast searched me. The word search is an interesting word. He's examined me. He's examining me right now. He's examining you right now. He said, oh, the Lord, thou search me and know me. Oh, we're not strangers to God. Oh, I'm glad of that, aren't you? We're not strangers to God. He knoweth and searched me. He said this, thou knowest my downsetting. You know, he, he observed us as we walked around, as we shook hands one with another, and then we all sat down. God said they finally got back and found their seats so the choir can go on or the music can go on. But what I'm trying to bring about is we need to understand this. We are never without the scrutiny of God. He said, he knoweth our down settings and our uprisings. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compass my path, my lying down. Thou art acquainted with all, again, that Lord, all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Interesting, because he even knows it before it gets out of the mouth. You know, it's so interesting that we have a God like that, and yet we exist before him. and said, God doesn't know anything about it. We decide to keep some things secret from God. You don't keep anything secret from God. The very depths of your emotions are fully, God is fully aware of it. And what he desired to hide, listen, God is fully aware. He said in Psalm 90 verse 8, he says, And thou hast set our iniquities before thee. Oh, do you realize what he just said? What you're trying to hide from God, what you're trying to hide from your neighbor, what you're trying to hide from the preacher. He said, listen, he said, he has set our iniquities that's a grief, isn't it? I know that God's forgiven sin. I understand that. But we live, we, we're not free of sin. We need to understand that. He, the Lord himself said in 1 John, he said, we're not perfect. We not understand. He's, he said, thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of his countenance. What a kind of a scrutiny can we understand? Listen, in view of this, I think we need to understand how important it is. And it says here that uh, 1 John 1, 7 through 9, he says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth from all sin. And if we say that we have no sin, in other words, we say I'm perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I put these verses in to get us to understand that God is fully aware, fully aware of you and every moment of your existence. So we find that you say, well, this secret sin that I've been hiding from everybody, not from God, you're not. The truth of it. He says, so what do we find? What are we supposed to do? Well, if we're convicted of that sin, he says what? We, we repent of that sin, we confess that sin, and when we do, these are the very same things that we got salvation with, aren't they? Very same thing. But here now, we're not getting salvation because we're already saved, but we do get restoration. Did you ever have uh, somebody that uh, uh, you just didn't like the way they treated you? And you just kind of ignore them or kind of push them aside or not really consider much time. But wasn't it good when you, when you got restored, when you got back with that, when peace was made? Listen, that's what God wants to make. He wants us to conduct our lives and our affairs to the place that we can fully understand that God can see us and we hide nothing from him. We're open before God with whom we have to do. But there's yet another aspect of this wonder or omniscience of God. It is not only our sins, our failings, our shortcomings that are known to him, but our needs, our struggles, our problems, and our afflictions. Oh, thank God for that. Not only just our sins and our problems, but he says, listen, I know your needs. I guess everybody in here has some kind of a need. Something somewhere it's lacking in something, something it's is need of. God says, I know that need. He said, I know you're struggling with it. Some struggling with finances, some struggling with health, some struggling with a whole lot of things. God says, I, I know that. I'm fully aware of that. 
So, so he says, our struggles and our problems. Anybody in here don't have problems? I didn't think I'd get a hand on that one, and I didn't. Because as long as we live in this old world, we're going to have some problems. Some of them of our own making, I grant you that. But sometimes you don't have to be the maker of it. They just seem to come along. That's the course of this old sin-cursed world in which you're living. And how about afflictions? I know we all have our physical problems, do we not? I know we are holding up prayer. Our prayer list is getting longer and longer and longer. Seems like the longer we live, the longer the list grows with us. But God is fully aware of it. So he promises that he will take care of those as well. He said in John 1, 5, he said, I will be with thee and I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. That's not John, that's Joshua. I can't read my own writing up here. But it's Joshua. He said, I'll be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. He said, I will have none that leave thee nor forsake thee. And that's Hebrews 13, 5. So this, this, this scrutiny. So it's our next point is not only does he aware of that, not only is he aware of everything, but one great joy is God says, I'll see you through. God says, you may think you can't make it. You may think you face an impossible situation, but God says, no, there's nothing impossible with God. Sometimes we won't give it to God. Sometimes we don't turn it over to him, but nothing is impossible with God. He said in Job 23.10, but he knoweth the way that I take. He knoweth the way that I take. He knew everything about us. He knows the way I take. And when he have tried me, when he's tried me, you say, I'm really being tried. I'm having all kinds of problems, preacher. You don't know how much, but you know God does. And here's what he says. When he have tried me, I shall come forth as gold. The most precious commodity in our world. But God says his gold is better than our gold. 1 Peter 1, 6 says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if needs be, ye are in heaven is through manifold temptations. But he said that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Do you realize what that just said? He said, what you're going through now, I have a purpose in it. He said, what you're suffering now, you may say, oh, God, uh, get rid of this. Oh, God, get change this. God, do this. But God says, I'm allowing you to walk my chosen pathway to you, but I want you to understand when we're finally done with it, when we're tried with fire, shall be found in the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Who, one of these days, all my problems will be gone. But I got news for you. One of these days, all your problems will be gone as well. You know, the proper attitude toward these things is very strongly assisted when we read and believe certain promises of the Word of God. He said, as far as sickness is concerned, a lot of folks here this morning having problems. You have some loved ones that are having problems. Listen to what God says, Psalm 41, 3. He said, the Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. God says, I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that grief. I'll take care of that heartache, the bed of language. And thou will make all his bed in his sickness. God says, one of my children doesn't go down that I'm not aware of it. One of my children doesn't face the grief of a, of a knife and surgery. But God says, I'm fully aware of it. One won't face the news that the doctor says, I can't do any more for you, but God can, and God will. That's the great joy of something like that in the sickness. How about in the time of trouble, Psalms 5015 says, and call upon me in the day of trouble. Call upon me, he says, in the day of trouble. And he said this, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. That's a grief about that verse, partial. He, sometimes we do call upon the Lord, and he does deliver us, but we don't glorify God for it. We never stop to thank God. You know, sometimes we're so busy telling his troubles, we forget to tell him about the blessings that he's passed our way. 
We forget to tell him how good he has been to us and how, how wonderful he is walking in the, uh, in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. He takes care of our troubles. The temptation, 2 Peter 2, 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to the punished. And it says, or anything, 2 Timothy 4, 18 says, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Man, what a promise. I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got all kinds of problems. I'm about to lose my house. My bank account's overdrawn. I just got bad news from the doctor, but listen what he said. He said, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto the heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God says, I'll take care of you all the way down the road we call life. And I guarantee you, when you're in me, when you know my son, when you have taken him into your heart, everything's going to be fine when the kingdom comes. Deliver us from all of them. Psalm 34, 19. Said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Oh, wait a minute. I thought the affliction belonged to the lost. No. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous here. But the Lord delivered him out of them all. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Said, there hath no temptation taken you, but as such is common to man. But God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. God doesn't promise he'll take care of your problem. You may have to be bearing that problem and that burden, that sickness or whatever is upon your life. You may be bearing that, but he just says, I'm not going to take it away from you. How helps then have you cried and said, oh God, uh, take away my gout. Oh God, take away my, my, uh, my whatever you got. But he didn't say he'd take anything away. He said, but I'll make a way of escape. That you might be able to bear it. He might just give you something else to compensate for what he has decreed that you're going to have to bear in your lifetime. But he said, I will give you the strength whenever you need it. When your problem, whenever your situation comes more than you can possibly handle, God said, I'll be there and I'll make a way that you might be able to bear it. Give us extra strength. Give us a subdivision. Well, I don't know how you do it. I only know that he said he would do it. I've experienced that in my life. And so if you, if you'll stop and think back of some of the courses where God's hand. Romans 8, 18 says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Think about what he just said. All my problems, all my grief, all my sore feet, all I've got, everything I've got. He said, it doesn't make any difference. He said, what he promised is the fact that this, he said, listen, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, whatever you're hurting with, whatever's happening in your life now, whatever, he said, all the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Paul put it rightly when he said this in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He said, for our light affliction. Now think about that statement. Shipwrecked, danger of his life, journeys often despised and hated, headed for Caesar's court where he was going to lose his head on. He said, for our light afflictions. <laughs> you know, that's what made that outlook, Paul's outlook with that. But God says, listen, we can have that outlook as well because really understand me when I say this, please kindly. God loves you just as much as he loved Paul. You're precious in the sight of the Lord just as much as Paul. But he said, listen, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Did you ever stop to consider that maybe the problem you have now is God given to you that you might know the exceeding weight of glory? One of these days, it'll certainly be made and will be improved for us. It's a shame that so many Christians who rejoice in the knowledge of their salvation fall into Satan's snare, getting them to think that God is not watching them. God, don't you care? Have you ever said that? I've heard people say it. God, you don't care. 
about me. I prayed, I've asked you, God, you, you don't even know I'm having this problem. Yes, God does. Think that God is not watching because he said, his eyelids try the children of men. And you know, you're one of his precious one. That he does have interest. And he says it so. Listen just a couple of scriptures and I'll, I'll, I'll be close here. Psalm 33, 13 through 14 says this. The Lord looketh from heaven and he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. God's watching you and me right now. With nothing escaping him. He goes in Psalm 66, 77, he says this. He rules by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations and let the rebellious exalt themselves. Let not the rebellious exalt itself. Jeremiah 17, sin. Says, I, Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Hebrew 4, 13 says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto him, the eyes of him who would have to do. So are we not called to a holy life? Are we not called to serve him? And in that service to God, mark it down. It's not easy sometimes. I'll be glad to ask any man that's ever served God. I could ask Brother Tap over here. One thing, yeah, I am. I'm convinced of one thing. We don't have this in heaven. <laughs> I, I know where it belongs, but thank you, Brother Ron. Thank you, Pastor. Brother, what is your name up there in the balcony? <laughs> oh, anyway, where am I? Anyway, God will take care of you. That's about all I can say. His promise is that he can, and his promise is that he will, and his promise is that I know what's going on with you right now. And above all else, God says, I love you. I love you. And you know, if you're here and you don't know the Savior I've been talking about, I found out something. God loves you as well. That he wants you to become one of his children. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, would you bow your heads with me just a moment? Make this more of a private time. If you're here and don't know Christ as your Savior, and the Lord has spoken to your heart about the need of a Savior, would you just slip up your hand, hold it? Eyes are closed, heads are bowed except mine, and mine don't matter, it's the Lord's that's watching. If you're here and don't know Christ as your Savior, and the Lord's speaking to your heart about it, would you just up your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. Pray for me. I need the Lord. And I'll be glad to pray for you. I may not know your name, but I assure you one thing. He knows your name. And he died on the cross of Calvary for you. He paid the price that you might be saved. Is there one? Would you stand with me?